Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stacy, and I'm a bookseller and the events coordinator at Belmont Books. Belmont Books, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is an independent and locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a number of virtual events coming up, including Doris Irovici, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, discussing Minus One with Rishi Reddy on Tuesday, and Claire Willis and Marnie Crawford Samuelson discussing Opening to Grief on Wednesday. You can register for these and our other events on our website, philmontbooks.com, which is also where you can purchase tonight's book, Fabrications. If you have any concerns during the presentation, you can send a message in the chat section. If you have any questions for the author, please put them in the Q&A section and uh, we will try to get as many of them answered as possible after the presentation. We're very excited to welcome Pam and Ginny. I wanna tell you a little bit about them and then I will turn the event over to them. Pamela Painter is the author of four other short story collections and is the co-author of a widely used textbook on writing. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Harper's, The Kenyon Review, Plowshares, The Sewanee Review, The Three Penny Review, and elsewhere. She teaches creative writing at Emerson College. Pam is the winner of three Pushcart Prizes and Agnes John Cheever Award for Fiction. She has received grants from the Massachusetts Artist Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Her stories have been produced by Word Theater, Wellfleet Harbor, Actors Theater, and Stage Turner. Additionally, her story titled Reading in His Wake was recorded for the CD Love Hurts. Virginia's Pie Collection, Pie's Collection, sorry about that. Pie Collection. <laughs> yes, for that. Uh, Shelf Life of Happiness won the 2019 Independent Publisher Gold Medal Award for short fiction. And one of the stories was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. She's also the author of two award-winning novels, River of Dust and Dreams of the Red Phoenix. Virginia has taught writing at New York University and the University of Pennsylvania, and most recently at Grub Street. She grew up in Belmont and now lives with her husband in Cambridge. And without further ado, I will turn this event over to Pam and Ginny, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Stacy. that's terrific. Oh, Pam, this is so fun. Um, it has been a complete delight getting to know you and getting to be friends over the past five years since I moved back to Cambridge. Um, it's definitely been uh, one of the highlights of being here. And, um, and I'm so happy about your collection of um, new and selected stories and um, had the pleasure of knowing you as you went through the process of, of working on this collection. And so I'm psyched to dig down and ask you more about that and your process. Um, and um, anyway, how are you feeling after yesterday? I, mean, I don't think we can ignore it all together what a big day yesterday was. Isn't that the truth? Absolute, just relaxed now. I, I feel like I don't have to turn on the news and find out what's happening with, uh, with the Donald. It is, Biden is so sane and so decent such a good man and he is doing extraordinary things. I think the All idea right. that he is bringing just a real uh, troop of uh, people in with know-how. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Jenny, was it you who told me that Fauci was on and he seemed so happy to be to be with someone saying that he giggled. Like <laughs> I love that. That's good. I can believe it. I mean, I feel like I've been doing that too. And just yeah. generally more relaxed. And like you said, don't have to check every few minutes to see if there's more chaos has been sown. Um, I think so, I'm the reading done as a result. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Time to dig in and enjoy um, books and novels especially and the short stories. So, so speaking of which, I think since we can kind of clear our minds more readily and just, you know, zoom in, um, I'd love to hear you read. Um, do you want to start out by reading your story, The Bridge? Sure, um, yeah. And thank you for suggesting that. And Stacy, thank you for having us. And um, okay, this is a story, I think it was one of my first really short stories and that's always interesting to me that that started me off in writing flash fiction so Jenny I will begin great this is a story called the bridge 
A bicycle whizzes past her from behind just as she steps onto the pedestrian walkway of the bridge. It startles her. It also startles a young woman who is walking slowly 50 feet ahead of her, cradling a bundle of something, a potted plant, flowers, a baby, she can't tell. Belatedly, she has the impulse to call something nasty to the young man on the bicycle, but he is moving away too fast. Anyway, the young woman must have said something to him because he swings his head around to her, slowing down just slightly before he zooms away more dangerous than ever. He could have injured both of them, the mother and the baby, or crushed the flowers. She herself carries her purse slung over her shoulder on a long strap and in her left hand a bag of groceries, no jars or cans. English muffins, two lamb chops, a bottle of red wine, a ripe cantaloupe. The wind from the bay is brisk, cool. Below the bridge, the ribbon of water reflects the fall's gray-white sky. She stops to button her jacket, wrap her scarf smartly around her neck. The young woman ahead has also stopped. She doesn't know why she says young woman, because she might be a grandmother out for a stroll or a volunteer for the elderly on her way, bright flowers and a lot to, with bright flowers and a lot to say. Squinting the young woman into sharper focus brings no more illuminating details than a scarf that matches nothing else she wears. She has changed the bundle from her left to right arm. If she catches up to the young woman, and if there is a child bundled into the blanket, blanket, perhaps they might talk for part of their trip across the long bridge. For instance, they might exclaim about the rudeness of the boy in the bicycle, or she might smile at the baby. How old, she might ask. Is it a boy or girl? Or perhaps, what lovely flowers? Although she can imagine that people might not respond to this, beyond a polite murmur of agreement, perhaps because they have nothing to do with making flowers. Ahead of her, the young woman stops again and leans over the heavy iron railing of the bridge. The young woman is looking down into the water as if something has caught her eye, something worth the pause. She too stops, torn between catching up to the young woman and wanting to see what holds her interest in the water. She sets her grocery bag down between her feet and peers over the shoulder high railing into the water below the young woman. There are no barges or colorful sailing boats, no sightseeing cruises. So what can it be? As she looks back up again in a graceful curve as of a ballet gesture, the young woman throws her bundle over the side of the bridge. She strains against the railing and tries to guess the weight of it, the drift of flowers, or the downward spiral of a helpless infant, but she cannot. It lands with a soft plop like a tire puncture, floats an instant, then disappears with tiny bubbles. Paper of the kind from the floor's salon roll or a small square of blanket drifts past the original spot until it too has gathered enough water to sink. There has been no color, only white paper around flowers or a baby's white blanket. She screams, whirling, whirling around to passing cars, but they are traveling by too swiftly. She turns back to the young woman, turns toward the young woman whose coat is blowing open in the breeze. She realizes immediately that if it was, or rather is a baby, what would be the difference? Would she throw down her groceries, tear off her jacket and scarf, leaving them draped over the railing? kick off her shoes, which she call to anyone to witness her leap, even a young mother who now stands motionless, her arms withdrawn from the graceful arc of her throw. And then after the climb under the iron railing higher than it looks, the leap into the water, the cold high shock of the water, even now half believing something has died, she does not jump. She hurries toward the young woman, heels clicking like a mugger sure of his prey and silence no longer necessary. She half expects the young woman to hear her footsteps turn toward her and then run. Another bicycle passes and she wants to cry out, send for help, but she can't find the right words. What can she tell even her husband later as they sit with a glass of wine and watch the news? She glances again at the darkening river. Her scarf streams behind her and below a large camellia floats in the water where the bundle was dropped or a small baby's bonnet, white and scalloped. She runs on, the sack of groceries banging against her legs, bruising the cantaloupe. I was watching, she calls out to the young woman, breathless, 
I was standing over there, pointing, she tries to determine just how far away she was, but can't identify her precise place along the stark railing of the bridge. The young woman turns but doesn't run. Together they stare at the place where she stood on the bridge. The young woman's face is smooth and shiny like a plate, and yes, young. Her eyes are gray as the water, and she raises them to the sky as if looking for signs of changing weather. Her hands fill her pockets. Her arms are tight against her sides where a bundle was. Is she used to strangers talking to her, calling breathless from 15, 10 feet away? She herself isn't used to watching babies being thrown into the river or even flowers. There is a story in flowers too, although a far different tale, probably romantic and full of meaningless gestures, predictable details. I saw you throw something into the river, she says. The young woman seems to consider everything, then says, I heard you call out, are you, are you all right? The young woman continues, I think it is going to rain again. It ruined everything I planned. The grocery bag feels heavy and she sets it down as if it contains quarts of heavy, rich milk. What was it? She asks the young woman. What did you throw into the river? The young woman seems to think that the question does not refer to specific things like flowers or babies as she glances at the bag of groceries, perhaps wondering if she should offer to carry them or making a list of what she herself needs from the store. I must go, she says, putting her hands in her pockets again, and she goes. She watches the young woman once more recede into the distance. In her wake, Cambridge neon begins to breathe above the gray water. The subway thunders past her on its short sojourn across the bridge outside the tunnel. How much does a baby weigh? She stoops down and moves aside English muffins, the wine. She hefts the cantaloupe before lifting it out with both hands. She tries to palm it like a basketball but can't suspend it in one hand. And so as she holds on with one hand to the railing of the bridge, she pulls her arm back over her shoulder, her hand under the ripe fruit. Lacking the grace of the young woman's motion, she heaves it like a catapult out into the river. She tries to remember the soft plop of entry, and failing that, she listens for a cry. Whoops. <laughs> Ah, oh, Pam, I love that story. I just love that story. That story has so much drama and it starts out so simply and you think it's a story about nothing, just an average day, just walking across a bridge, a woman with groceries in her arms. And then it just escalates and escalates and it's all because of her active imagination that she starts to imagine these things. It's... <laughs> I love that. It's so great. Your characters often have very vivid imaginations. Is that? Yeah. Sure. I think we all do. Jenny, you do too for your, your stories and novels. But I mean, also, I think one's vivid imagination is often just very much planted in reality. And mm -hmm. um, this is the salt and pepper bridge. Mm -hmm. you know, right. between Cambridge and Boston. Right. And um, I was out walking with a friend uh -huh. and she had a baby carriage and a little baby and she was carrying a baby. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> what would I do if she threw her baby over the bridge? <laughs> See, now not everybody thinks that way. That's a special, <laughs> it takes a special, you know, creative mind there, a, a fiction writer's mind. But of course, of course. Yeah, and uh, you know, when I, I, so I wrote this story and I never did make a decision about what it was, but my thought as I was walking behind yeah. my friend is, what if she threw her baby over the bridge? Mm -hmm. Would I go after it? Right, right. <laughs> I didn't swim well at all. Right. And what would I do? Anyway, she was not happy when I published that story. It's <laughs> very funny. <laughs> The, um, you know, it's just so much, there, there's, there's so much mystery in it too, because that's the thing about the imagination. It can go in any di different direction. It could be a baby. It could be flowers. It could be paper down there in the water. It could be a baby blanket. Um, 
there's one line that I love, which is, um, there's a story in the flowers too. I feel like you could have titled your book that also. <laughs> because there's so many, there's so many possible stories here. Um, I love that. And so that brings me to the actual collection and how it has just such a variety of stories told from all sorts of different characters, perspectives, crazy scenarios. Um, and I say crazy just in the sense, just highly inventive and quirky and um, so entertaining, each one of them. And, um, you know, but I think what they all have in common is this sheer joy in the act of, of fabricating, of inventing and of creation, I think. I, I don't know. I, that it seems like you have more fun than most writers I know. <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the, the title of my textbook with, with Anne Bernays is titled, What If? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I seem to always be open to that possibility. And uh, I never know where I'm going when I start a story. Mm -hmm. And how often, in the, you know, partway through a story, just say, what if? Yeah. And then I'm off with uh, various scenarios for how to how to end a story. But right. And you don't restrict your own characters' imaginations. Like often, you you have a, a great imagination to even think of the setting and the place and the conundrum they're facing. But then your characters come up with all of these fabrications themselves. They start inventing, as we just saw in the bridge. And I love that. You know, that's I think that's a very particular thing that you do. Have you? I, I, I call that the interior landscape of the characters. And um, yeah. Yeah, if every character has their own personality and their own fears and desires and something they're afraid of. Yeah. Uh, for example, when I, I don't know, way up into college, before I got into bed at night, I used to look under my bed. <laughs> and, I, don't know, I don't know what I thought I was going to find there. I, I didn't know what I was you know. so I finally thought I've never written a story about that right so I had to give that habit to a character right and then continue the story not as myself but as this uh as this character so anyway I added a Ouija board and tarot cards and a roommate and yeah friends and yeah. You create a whole world around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I also love how you have women characters in particular who end up, you know, basically using their imaginations to create new lives for themselves. Like they, they just start to concoct different versions of reality so that they can get out of the lives they're in, you know. Um, so there's one, A Fabricated Life um, is a story, well, you can describe it if you want, but it's, I, I love that one and also in getting to know the weather. They're each women who um, just in, invent their own scenarios and then go towards them. Like, well, I was gonna say in The Fabricated Life, a woman who's uh, pretty much of a mess, we can tell that right from the start, um, her niece is suddenly coming to visit her. And for many years, she's been writing to the niece's mother, her sister, um, and, and inventing a life, describing a life that isn't at all like her life, a life that's very together and, you know, in which she has a boyfriend and a job and various things that she definitely does not have. But now suddenly that the niece is coming to visit, she actually has to create the life that she has invented in her writing all along. So I love that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, she starts to lie. You know, she has, yeah. she has this pretty, you know, kind of shabby life. She, no job. She's no job. addicted certainly to alcohol, probably to drugs. No boyfriend. A nerdy guy at the office. You know, but um, right. Pam, hang on one sec. Someone's just asked if we, could, if you could turn up your volume. I can I get is, closer? Is that you get closer? Volume? You can also turn on your keyboard. Can you make your volume go any higher? Yep. I just I just tried. You got it. Okay. So let us know, folks, if if that's still an issue. Um, yeah, exactly. So she, so then she just starts to write, um, she, she, in this case, it's that she's writing the, her, she's written a version of a better life. And then she has to change her life to fit the, the version that she's written. Yeah, well, right. And this, I guess, is being sent to, to live with her. 
Right, right. Um, yep, so so the, the guy at the office turns into someone who becomes acceptable. And I think she gets a cat. She's yes. left with a cat. She can't remember what she said the cat's name was. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, invention is, that's the heart of fiction, isn't it? I know, but it but it turns out it's also the heart of life because you've got characters who, like in another story, you in getting to know the weather, you've got a woman character who, you you, you can definitely tell she wants something different from what she has, and the way she goes about doing it is she goes and she hangs out in diners, and she listens over hears um, eavesdrops on the waitresses and listens carefully to their language and what they talk to customers about. It's like she's taking notes in her mind for how waitresses act. And that's all because she can then go and get a job as a waitress and sort of invent herself as someone who's been working for years as a waitress. Um, and it's a way out, it's a way out of her life. And she lies about that. She says she has been a waitress when she goes to get the job. Right. But, you know, in, in that collection, somebody pointed out that I had two or three or four canopy beds. Oh in yeah. Stories. And you know, I've never owned a canopy bed. And I was just looking through a, another story collection, the later story collection, and there's that canopy bed again. I must dream about them. I must long you must, for the you canopy must, bed. They must, they must stand for something in your mind. You know, they, they symbolize something. I don't know what. But, oh my um, God, I never even thought yeah. of that. I, to me, a canopy bed was a canopy bed and somehow it crept into my stories. And Right, there it is. No escaping it. Well, it seems like you have these, particularly the women characters who use invention as a way to, um, you know, make their lives, change their lives. And, and it makes me wonder about you and, how, and the role writing has played in your life to go from where you have grown up to where you are now. And, and uh, I don't know what, what, how you've, you've, how writing has made you have this extraordinary life, it seems to me. Well, you know, the, the idea of the fork in the road, look at that. The fork in the road is always a right angle too, right? Or 45 degree, anyway. Yeah. And I had a fork in the road when I was teaching high school. I went to grad school and then I was teaching high school and I was given a creative writing class to teach. And I told the principal, somebody said I should have dedicated a book to him. <laughs> I told the principal that I don't know anything about creative writing. I'm an inveterate reader. I read all my life. Mm. But, I, and, but he said, you have to teach it. So I went into the class and I said, okay, tomorrow what I want you to do is bring in a, write a story tonight and bring in a story tomorrow. And the students bitched and moaned, rightfully so, right? Yeah. <laughs> Overnight <laughs> writing a story, okay. <laughs> Bullshit, I'll do it with you. Good. And I wrote my first short story that night. Wow. And I just became addicted to writing short stories. Yeah. And the second story I wrote, I was a became a published story. And uh, wow. You know, I was I was a reader though. There's a Saul Bellow quote that um, I love. It's Every writer is a reader moved to emulation. Mm. Um, and I ask my students, I just assume they're readers. If they're not readers, then I don't think they'll be writers. But um, That's a wonderful quote and so true. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And yeah. so this collection is not just, well, this collection. Let me just go. So I would not be a writer yeah. if I hadn't been given that course to teach. I, I, I just, where would it, I just don't think I would have been. I was forced to do awesome. something. And, and that is almost terrifying that I, I could have gone in there and complained and said, I don't want to teach this course in creative writing. And he could have said, okay, take this other English class. And I would have been thrilled to go back to teaching Catcher in the Rye and Othello and- uh, Wow, uh, yeah, yeah. that's so interesting. That is so interesting. Although I do have to think that you have this, really wonderful imagination that sees stories everywhere. Um, they are, I mean, the fact that you've written so many short stories, it means that you're just finding gems that you can turn into stories everywhere. So I have a, I just have a suspicion that you would, it, it would have come out in a different way. There'd be another fork in the road that might've happened, but 
but good that it was this one because it, it's given you a lot of you know time to keep writing. Um, so this collection is not just brand new stories, it's selected stories. And I'm really curious um, from your four previous collections, how you went about picking and choosing what stories to include and what that experience was like to look back on your body of work. Uh, it, was, it was difficult to do because there were so many stories. And <clears throat> I, I said to someone, I feel like there's a ghost of this collection that sort of says, Pam, you forgot me. But um, the way I, I you know, chose the stories is I put them all in tiny little cards about like that. And I put the cards on a table. These, they're like about the size, I think I probably use business cards, the back oh, of a business card. Really small. The title and um, the point of view, whether it was a male or female, because I use a lot of male characters. Yep. Uh, whether there was a death there, whether a character gets murdered. <laughs> I love to <laughs> murder some of my characters. To, and, um, or, or whether a story is humorous. So I tried to get a real, a real mix of the stories and then length. Um, you know, what's, how, how, how many stories are five pages and how many stories are, are 20 pages. And, right. And then I wanted stories from each collection. So it really, it really, it was hard. And there's that ghost of a collection still out there. I hope that comes to light. I, I have a suspicion it will. Um, and, and did you notice any sort of larger um, ways or trends in the writing that have changed, has changed over the years? Like, so sort of, so for example, the stories that you wrote in the 80s, are they more minimalist? Are they more, you know, Carver-esque or anything like that? And did you have a maximalist period or did you, you know, is there any stylistic differences through the years? Uh, stylistic. Well, I did go through a period when I had three kids and was doing a lot of ghostwriting. I went through a period where the stories got shorter and shorter and I was really thrilled to be able to write a story there was a hundred words or a story that was 250 words and find it in a lot of anthologies. That, that was great. But one of the things that, that did change um, is when, when I first started writing, I was married to my first husband and he, it was not a happy marriage. And he said, I don't want to read any of your stories about women complaining about their husbands. No female, no unhappy female stories. Wow. So I wrote my first stories from a male point of view. Uh, I, you know, a drummer, a mailman. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I've always felt very, very comfortable with that male point of view. And I continued to use that. But then I got a divorce. <laughs> and after I got a divorce, I wrote a lot of stories from the wife's point of view. Right. Yeah, and uh, liberated, yes, liberated, right. As a matter of fact, I felt so guilty at writing so many stories about the wife's point of view that I then wrote a story from my husband's point of view. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Some of the stories have nothing at all to do with, with memoir or biography. Right. No, they they definitely don't seem like they do. I mean, they sort of range all over the place. On the other hand, there are several murders and women getting back at their husbands, I have to say. Those are thrown in there. I, I assume you wrote those after the marriage was over, but maybe not. No, I did. I did. But what what is unusual about those stories is it's from the husband's point of view mm -hmm. and where the husband is a pissy type and sort of belatedly realizes that his wife is unhappy with him. And <laughs> a little too late. <laughs> <laughs> realizes a little, a little too late. late. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. He's, uh, he's, you know, the, the reader is thinking, oh my God, this guy, what a nightmare. He's, he is, a, what a pain in the ass this guy is. And sure enough, the wife has been thinking that all along, as it turns out. And yeah, just uh, him. she pushes yeah. him. I don't know. I guess she. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. over the edge over the cliff right. yes yes and you know the reader's sort of like all right good move you know because by that point we're pretty sick of him we're this guy's pretty terrible so 
That is so uh, funny. What yeah. was, it, was, it was fun to write a story from the point of view of someone who's not a pleasant character. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty soon you side with the character whose point of view you don't know. Right. You hope that she's going to take some, you know, take events into her own hands and she does. <laughs> right, she definitely does. <laughs> You know, a lot. About him. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know? Well, so that's a question about your stories. The endings are are really masterful. They are uh, often very surprising and very um, just end on a really often dramatic and wonderful note that you feel like there couldn't be any other ending to this story is how it feels. Um, and, you know, I have to read it over again um, just because it's so satisfying. And um, and I wonder, like, did you know in that story, for example, like what was going to happen to that guy who was such a pain in the neck and, and how it was going to end for him? Or do you just write, you don't write towards something or do you write towards towards your endings? No, I, I never know how a story is going to end. Um, I know I probably knew those stories weren't going to end well, but I, I really have no idea. And somebody said, I, in the last webinar I was on, I used the phrase, a gift from the gods. And this friend of mine said, do you realize you said that five times? <laughs> I don't even believe in God. <laughs> so so I, I feel like stories are really gifts from the gods. And uh, when I was teaching high school, I used a book called um, Technique in Fiction. Oh yeah, Polly and Lanning, and it what it, that book said is that you always have to know where your story is going. You always have to know the ending before you begin. Huh? Otherwise, you'll never get there. So anyway, so I was teaching that in high school, and I thought, oh dear, I'm doing something wrong. Anyway, so I I stopped teaching. I had three kids. I got a divorce. I had a few years of whatever, and I never <laughs> met my future husband. Whatever is good though. Yeah, whatever, <laughs> whatever informs some of your stories, I'll just say. Indeed, it does, yes. Yeah. And then I met my future husband, yeah. who was the author of that book. And when you marry someone or you're with someone, you always have secrets. Yes. It has to do with other relationships. Right. Well, mine was my relationship with fiction, and after we were married, I had to tell Roby, Roby, he, he was a fiction editor of Playboy, and, and, but I had to tell him that I never knew where my stories were going. And he was <laughs> astonished. Was he? Yeah, he just couldn't believe that anyone would start a story and not know the ending. How interesting. And, uh, you know, we all look for signposts, and my signpost there was Flannery O'Connor, who uh -huh. said, you don't have to know the ending. Otherwise, how will you surprise yourself? Yes. And she says, I wrote, I was writing a story. This is Good Country People. And she said, I was writing a story and suddenly I had equipped a mother with a daughter with a wooden leg. And I mean, that story, the Bible salesman steals the daughter's leg. But I, I love that, equipped a mother with a daughter with a wooden uh -huh. leg. So, <laughs> Right, that it came to her as she was, as it was evolving, which is which her process. Well, I'm a little surprised he wasn't more aware that some writers do write without an ending. I mean, that's oh well, it's it's uh, he it seemed to work for him, I guess. Right. Right. Well, he wrote the book saying, "Don't do it," you know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> but then, did he end up respecting? I, I'm sure he did. Your your effort. Oh, uh, one of one of the ways I met him is he was uh, I was living in Chicago at the time. And he was on a uh, a judging a committee judging um, Illinois short fiction, and one of my stories won a grant or an award, and he was on the committee. And uh, and I met him, and then you know yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> eventually we <laughs> married and moved to Boston. That is great. Didn't he also? Um, well, you have been at the forefront of flash fiction. And for, you know, since it's, since it began pretty much, right? And, and can you say, um, well, I'm so curious how you over the years have thought about 
when you have an idea for a story, how you know about its length. Is that something you know in advance or is it more, um, is it based on sort of the, the, the density of the image in your mind or how long you think it'll take for you to, for it to unfurl and become a story um, or do you just see where it leads you? You know, it, it, that's the one thing I do know that it's going to have a little arc of maybe 300 words or three pages, or it's going to be 20 pages. I, I almost always know the length ahead of time. Uh -huh. And then I probably, as I start the story, the, the sentences begin to show that the arc is going to be a longer story. Interesting. But, um, I love both forms. I'm still writing both. I'm working on a story now that's a much longer story and then one that's one page about the dog that barks in the night. Oh, I love that. So. <laughs> that's great. Well, it's, um, I, I was wondering just based on the collection, it seems like the longer stories are more at more towards the beginning or the earlier collections and then some of the, then the shorter uh, the flash fiction starts to come in at a certain point and it seems like you're doing more, but it's great to hear you're, you're doing both at this point. You're doing, um, you haven't segued from longer stories to exclusively doing shorter, shorter ones. Yeah, I, my middle collection was mostly short, short stories. Yeah. Short shorts. Uh, yeah. Short shorts, flash fiction. Yeah. And I was doing a lot of ghost writing then. I had three kids. So I was, I went back to grad school. And it's just nice to be able to uh, just come up with something. Like I, I just read a story about the word thoughtless. <laughs> That's such a funny expression that somebody's thoughtless because the thought embodies thought. And then when you add less. So I wrote a story about thoughtless, about this character and his wife accuses him of being thoughtless because he doesn't realize she's, she's missing. And then someone said to me, well, what about the word feckless? <laughs> and, uh, I never write a story about feckless because, you know, what is feck? I and mean, where did feckless ever come from? I have no idea. But I love the idea of you trying to write a, an accompanying story about feckless now that you've done thoughtless. That's great. <laughs> I, I might have to stick it in there somewhere. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's one page, that, that story. So your stories often start with a, with a character, it sounds like. I mean, like there's a thought, meaning about thoughtless, but really then the point is that you have to find a character who embodies whatever that thought is. You think? That's true, yeah, yeah. I usually character. have characters in mind. I, my, my kids, bless them, have given me a lot of stories. Uh, at one point, my younger son came back from <laughs> visiting his father and he said, mom, you have to sit down. You're not gonna believe these stories. And I sat down and I used some of those stories. They, uh, yeah. I bet I, can, I bet I can guess which ones. There's, there is one where uh, children are going back and forth between, or going to visit a, a, a divorced father and he's not doing really well, that fellow. He's uh, right. right. Yeah. Well, mothers kind of, you know, can be nasty too. I tried well, to that's true. It out, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that, that is true. And uh, yeah, that son, when he came to the first reading I did, I had totally forgotten. I had put in a detail about him. When we lived in Chicago, we had sort of a large house and the, the clothes chute was on the way to the third floor. And you would put your clothes in the clothes chute and they'd go down to the basement where you took okay. them out of the clothes chute and washed and dried them and et cetera. And my son had a Chicago Bears shirt and he thought, and I said to him, Derek, you're going to have to wash this shirt. You wear it every day. And he said, mom, I wash it every night. And I said, what are you talking about? He thought that the laundry was done in the clothes chute. <laughs> there he was at a reading and I came to this detail and I said, oh, Derek, and he said, oh, mom, but- That's um, so cute, that's so cute. So speaking of inventive, that's pretty inventive of him. You know, if someone could invent that, uh, that would be pretty great, yeah. that's pretty cool. And then but, I, I think one of my, the endings of one of my stories, I, I attribute to my daughter. I think it's a story called New Family Car, but you know, kids, 
kids have tough lives and and they tell each other stories they tell each other about uh about their lives and i i can remember during a snowstorm my daughter had a whole bunch of people over and and they were sitting in the next room and they were playing the game you know my life is more fucked up than your life and i was in the kitchen and i was listening to this and sure enough my daughter comes out with what's wrong with our lives right anyway after everybody went home i'm crying and she's crying she's standing in the doorway i said how could you do that and what she said was at least i didn't win Ooh. and, right. and i use that when yeah. i wrote that story i used that as the last line at anyway, least i didn't win yeah. my kids uh, they give me stories yeah, yeah. Well, you have such an ear for sort of the little, the, the, the nugget, the kernel at the heart of it. And, and so, you know, there you put it at the very last line, but sometimes it's what starts the whole story. So, mm -hmm. um, so we're going to ask if anyone has questions. Um, I have more for you too, but what's wonderful is I see that Margo Livesey has a question. Um, she says, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Margo. So sweet of you to be here. And a question from both of us, which is, what's the best advice you give your students that you find difficult to follow? Pam, I'm going to leave that to you since I'm not teaching right now. I think I think discipline. And um, I came up with this this little catchphrase that I wish I listened to, and I don't. The discipline is a form of self-respect. Mm. But dear Margot, I, I don't know what I was reading. I was re I have this whole hundred pages of quotes by people. And uh, at some point, somebody asked Margot if she is disciplined. And Margot, I don't know remember, I don't know if you remember when you said this, but she said something like, yes, she used to have a regimen for writing, and then it got in her way. And and again, you're looking for signposts. So that must have given me, that must have given me the you know just I could do what I wanted, yeah. and you know so so those signposts are are really really important. And and to hear that somebody thought they should have a regimen and then let it go um, was was important for me to hear. Right. And, um, okay. Yeah. I, I wish I had that quote at hand, but it was. It was important. So I so I write when I feel like it. Right. Right. But you do write an awful lot. I mean, you write regularly and it's it's a it's a muscle that you use and you don't let it go. Um, you know, you don't let it get too weak or more, uh, you know, unused. Right. So I can go a week without writing. You, know? you can. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But, but a month? Writing. Yeah. What's that? Sorry. One's mind is always writing. And also collecting stories that that you hear. Yes, yes. Well, this is what I really felt like I sensed so much when reading this collection was just how you have your antenna up all the time, I think. And you just you just grab things from out of the air and the things, the phrases that people say or the things that you pass on the street, or um, you know, that's the whole notion of finding um, you know, and then and then inventing from those little gems um well it's like you know one can steal stories or or you do my students sometimes come up with just great stories and i say to them you have to write that story and and they'll just say oh I don't, i'll never write that story and i had one student who was a bartender and and he told the class i don't even know how it came up he told the class about being a bartender and you know there'd be nights where uh the um the, <clears throat> the a couple would lock themselves into the ladies room or the men's room mm -hmm. and he said if it's you know it's they're either doing drugs or they're having sex and he he said in the ladies room you're doing drugs in the men's room you're having sex anyway so he said what he did one night was put a wedge under the door so <laughs> the couple couldn't get out I think his name was Jason. I said, oh, Jason, you have to write that story. He said, I'll never write that story. You can have it. So I wrote the story from the point of view of a young girl who worked for the bartender. 
Yeah. And that's been anthologized. That's been published two or three times and anthologized. And uh, love it. Yeah, love so, it. You find so much humor around in, in things like that. And this, the, actually, the next question comes um, has to do with that. Um, I mean, I, I, it's a good follow up to, to what you just said. Um, and that is, and so this is from John Ravenel, who happens to be my husband. He asks, where do you, Pam, stand on the writer's right to portray characters and rights and quotes um, to portray characters who come from very different backgrounds than, um, than, uh, who to, than his or hers? Is everything fair game as you follow your imagination? Um, what do you advise your students in this rapidly changing, more socially aware landscape? So this is the who gets to tell the story uh, question. And it is a, re this is such a good question in particularly in relation to your collection because you're, you write from so many different characters points of views. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can almost imagine anything in a way of plot, characterization, etc. But, mm -hmm. but the one thing I don't think I can do, I know I can't do, and, and it seems to me that Charles Baxter wrote about this also, where mm -hmm. he said, it's difficult to write a story from the point of view of someone who is much more intelligent than you are. Mm -hmm. And and I think he said that in terms of writing a novel, First Light. It's a novel that he wrote backwards, where where the ending was at the beginning of the novel, and then it goes it goes backwards in time. It's from the point of view I think of a brother. Boy, I haven't read this for like twenty years. Yeah. So I think it's from the point of view of a brother who uh, has a sister. I think who's a physicist or a scientist, oh. and. So I, I, I have limits, and I think they're sadly limits of intelligence. And oh, I hope. Well, you, I you I, suppose, I suppose you could spend an awful lot of time researching, um, you know, the physicist's uh, uh, knowledge, and then you could probably pull it off because I think you have plenty of intelligence. But but it seems like you're you know, that's a different type of writer and a different, you know, different type of interest. But, um, but do you, you feel okay, obviously writing about men, you feel okay writing about people of different ages. Um, what do you, what, you know, getting back to John's question. So what do you say to your students right now when they probably particularly are so attuned to this question? Is this I, I feel like you can write about anything and from yeah. anybody's point of view, this idea that you have to have a very narrow focus from your own experience, I think is wrong. Zadie Smith wrote an absolutely brilliant essay saying, do anything, anybody's point of view is, is fair game. It really right. is. But I wanna go back to John's question a, a little bit in terms of, yeah. of this idea of intelligence. It is true that I could come up, I could do the research to do a story right from the point of view of a scientist. But I think the language of metaphor and simile, the language of, of that, that uh, you know, discipline would not be there for me. And yeah. you know, I dabble in, in art, I, I have pets. I think, you know, and I've, I grew up in a place called Paintertown. So I, you know, in terms of like my socioeconomic forebears were one thing and I live now and I go to the opera and, and so on. But um, but I, I think that idea of, uh, okay. yeah. Of, right, uh, right. Well, I think that does help you in the sense of you sort of have experienced different class backgrounds over over the span of your life. And so there's, there's a lot of feeling of freedom there to write about at least that. Um, aspect um but but yes i think you know trusting our imaginations and mostly doing it well is what's is really what counts i mean if you if you can't if you can't pull it off well then it's not going to work <laughs> um right, right. yeah I, I do tell my students i mean and and i i i came across this even before margot wrote the book but um i grew up as a reader i was an only child for a while and I was known as there's that Pam with her nose in a book. Mm -hmm. I mean, my relatives all said that and, and not with any approval. 
it was just like, oh, couldn't, couldn't imagine. So, so I was a, I was a reader and, um, and, and then I, I put this on my syllable and then syllabus for teaching. And then Margot eventually wrote a book about called Hidden Machinery. But this is, I think the most elegant thing ever said to a writer. Um, it's one must learn to read as a writer, to search out that hidden machinery, which it is the business of art to conceal and the business of the apprentice to comprehend. That is, that just says it all. That's beautiful. Uh, you know, what, what I wanna teach my students. Right. You have to read. And um, the other thing is, I, I think you have to believe in yourself. I, I love quotes. I have like a hundred pages of quotes. I love this. One of the ones I, I really like is um, Norman Mailer said that writer's block is merely a failure of ego. And so I, I just, I am intolerant of any student who says I, I just have writer's block. I, I'm intolerant of that. Um, right. and you, right. know, you just have to kind of like sit down and, and do it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, no, this is great advice. And those are beautiful quotes, each one of them. Um, William Howdeschel has a question, which is how long does it take to get the story down and then to rewrite and polish it? What decides what language stays and what goes? And how do you decide which parts to embellish and detail? Oh boy, that's a big, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, um, I, for my short shorts, I could, I could work on a short short for a week or for a year. Uh, it just, it, it's really getting the language right and, and the arc of the story right that I never talk about plot. As a matter of fact, when I, when when my partner and I wrote What If, the textbook, and yeah. sent it off, Harper Collins bought it. They were really excited about it. And and we sent it off and we didn't have the chapter called Plot. <laughs> it was <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we totally left plot out. And yeah. I um I taught at Vermont College for a long time with a guy, uh Douglas Glover, who came up with the term an unstable situation. And I like the idea that a story should always begin with an unstable situation. Mm -hmm. And so that to me, and, and then you unravel it. Yeah. And, and so yeah. I guess I guess it's that unraveling that it, you know, I, I do believe in revision. I, mm -hmm. I tell my students they have to revise. The difference between a good story and a published story is revision. So I might do I might do 17 drafts of a short story, uh, just un until I really feel like I get it right. And uh, that's great. Don't believe in that. Yeah. Right. right. Well, maybe the whole idea of plot. Um, I, I mean, I think there's a difference between trying to think about the arc of a novel and the arc of a short story, and that that the whole idea of plot would apply more or be absolutely necessary in a uh, in a novel. But but um, the phrase you used about the short sh could apply to the short story. Um, well, I mean, I, I would love to have written a novel. I I will never write a novel. And I mean, Ginny, you have short stories with one of the great titles of all time, The Shelf Life of Happiness. Well, that thank you. Really, and you've written uh, two or three novels, and. That is, I mean, to be able to write a novel and to sink into a world that is your world and uh, and yeah. live there for a year or I have one friend who- Three to five. Years. <laughs> Ten years is a bit much. Yeah. 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 That is, that's such a luxury that, that I don't have. Um, well, I think I think we all admire what you're able to do in a in in a more distilled and compact you know way. And um, if anything, my stories all could they all kind of want to be novels, and so they're they're a little bit pushing at the seams. So um, you know, I just think we all we each have different um, you know just what we're more comfortable with, I guess. Um, by the way, Margo wrote back and says, "Thank you, Pam. I'm still trying uh, to read as a writer." And we, yeah, we all know that um, that she's an extraordinary writer and reader. Um, Daniel is a writer. I mean, she has to. She's yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Daniela Devo, Daniela Devo, sorry. Pam, do you have advice for young readers that are filled in, uh, that are filled in an internet crazy world? How can we get more kids to dig into books? Oh, 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 you know, I, yeah, the internet is such a draw for, for younger readers. And I, you know, I went through the Hardy Boys and the Nancy Drews and then, and then I was allowed to read the teacher's library when I was in the seventh and eighth grade because I read so much. But, oh, I'm, you know, just go to the library and, and start reading, pull a book off the shelf, start reading the first paragraph because that, that should take you into the book. But, but it really is, it's difficult. I wish, I wish my grandsons read more books. I wish everybody read, I wish my students read more books. Yeah. Are you finding that to be the case that you have people who want to become writers or think of themselves as writers already, but aren't really reading very much? Is this a, is this a thing now? I think, yeah. I think they're not reading enough. Yeah. yeah. So that, you know, when I, I'm teaching a flash fiction workshop now, and so I, I'll, I give them examples of, uh, of stories that I think are, like to write a hundred word story and come up with a finished brilliant story in a hundred words and it can be done. But, yeah. um, but, but they really need examples of, of, that, um, of that writing. And I mean, one of the things about Margot's book, The Hidden Machinery is, um, is that she talks about the fiction that she's written and, and how, how it's come to be. In, in terms of like technique and so on. And, okay. uh, and then there's something called a marvelous paragraph that looks at pieces of fiction. I was reading an Alice Munro's story, The Bear Comes Over the Mountain, mm -hmm. and I came to a dream. And I was having a problem with one of my stories. I came to a dr this dream in Al the Alice Munro's story, yeah. and I stopped dead. I didn't finish the story. I went straight back to my story and used that technique. I'm not sure how I would have continued that story if I didn't have mm -hmm. Alice Monroe giving me a lesson. Right, you know, right. And mm -hmm. you're reading Anna Karenina now, Janet. Uh, Janet yeah. Janet, yeah. That, yeah. That is just glorious, isn't it? Too? I know, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. We're both, we're taking a class together on, uh, on Anna Karenina and it is really a treat. Um, so I think we're getting close to the end. Looks like, um, no, I think we've, we've answered all our questions and this is such a total delight, Pam. And um, I hope that, I mean, if, if you all haven't read Fabrications yet, it is masterful and enjoyable and um, unbelievably inventive. And um, there, are, there are moments where we laugh out, out loud, actually. Um, and it's really true. And, um, and the endings are just killer. And you just learn a lot from it as a, as a writer and as a reader, it's just unbelievably enjoyable. So I hope, I hope, I hope readers cry sometimes too. Oh, I forgot the crying. You know, yes. <laughs> you know, I, tell my, I tell my students, if they're writing a story, you yeah. know, and it's really moving, they should be crying as they're yeah. writing. They're really yeah. Crying. Yeah. And that is, speaking of things that are hard to accomplish in a short story, in a novel you have 300 pages to get to that emotion and you know you have a much you know you can you can do it you can build up to it but it, to be able to pull that off in a short story is really admirable so bravo thank you. brava i should say this is a treat well, thank you both so much for doing this pam nice to meet you and jenny welcome back as always great Love conversation you. And thank you everybody for coming. Hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that we see you at future events soon. Have a great night. Okay. Thank Bye. you, Stacey. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Bye.